next speaker is Stephanie Lansing, and she's from the University of Maryland, and going to be talking about the fate of antimicrobials during dairy manure management and processing. Thank you. So, um, so this effort, I'm going to talk about um, basically. Is this somebody's phone? You want this? Oh, that's my phone. I should buy it. <laughs> <laughs> so <a> yeah. <laughs> um, so this effort is part of a ongoing um, USDA NEFA grant, and then we also have a new one that we just started, another USDA um, NEFA grant on antibiotic resistance. So lots of people um, working on this project. Um, so again, when we look at antibiotic use, again, when you look at it, antibiotic use for animals versus humans, again, in the US, we have you know fairly high use, but again, that doesn't always relate to um, what's actually persistent in the environment. So, but again, when we look at the antibiotic use in the U.S., again, we have a high much being a, a livestock, but when we look at it, at what we're actually using, most of it is actually the tetracycline um, that's actually being used. So again, that's something that people focus on when they're looking at antibiotics in terms of agriculture. And this is, again, total, total. We already talked to you guys with the AOM. Um, the session this morning, we talked about, again, lumping these things all together is, is dangerous, but um, this is the data that we have. Um, so again, in terms of antibiotic resistance, why we care, um, again, one of the things that we were looking at is the idea in the gut of the cow, in the environment, the idea the, antibiotic, the antibiotics are there, if they're there, <coughs> and you have bacteria who are resistant to that, they may persist, and then they can pass their genes on to other um, bacteria um, so they can, again, do that horizontal gene transfer um, and, and, and get that resistance. So what we were specifically looking at is, again, there's lots of ways in which antibiotics gets into the environment. And again, looking at wastewater treatment plants, um, looking at livestock. Um, so we were specifically looking at the livestock, and then we were looking at the manure from this livestock and the land and water application of this manure. So there's a lot of ways in which it can get from wastewater treatment plants, contaminated meat and dairy, but again, this is the effect that we were looking at. Um, and what's really interesting, and again, coming from this morning's discussion, I think is um, this whole idea of, especially with dairy, there's so many different dairy manure management strategies. <laughs> and you know, a chicken manure is different than a dairy manure, which is different than a swine manure. And we talk about, animal, you know, AMR in agriculture. But, you know, it's such a different transmission pathway with each of these different types of animals and with humans. So again, we just focused with this effort, again, it was on the dairy specifically and the manure coming from the dairy. Um, so again, this is kind of saying the same thing. We were looking at the feces and looking at this is where we were going from the feces to the surface water. Um, but again, what we did was we actually had several farms that we were looking at, and we wanted to get this variety in manure management. We had some that compost, some that did solid liquid separation, some that had digestion, some that went to lagoon storage, some that had pack bedding um, for their sick cows. Um, but again, if you go to every farm, every farm, dairy farm, has a little bit different manure management strategy. Some were scraped, some were flush. Um, so I'm, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here. It's a manure conference. <laughs> and so we were trying to get a variety of these manure strategies. Um, and then we were also looking at, again, those that have physical separation of the sick cows and those that don't. Because again, if I am a sick cow, um, I, get, I get antibiotics administered. My milk does not go to the food supply, right? Because I'm sick. What often in a lot of our farms, what happens is that milk goes to the baby cows, the cats. So they get that milk. Um, not all, some might dump it into the manure pit, right? Um, but again, if I'm a sick cow, all of that manure usually gets commingled, okay? So any antibiotics that goes through, just like in us, if we take antibiotics, some comes through in our urine and feces, it's the same thing with the cow. So we are specifically looking at that that passes through the cows and then where it goes in this manure stream, depending on the manure processing. So, um, why this is, again, important, and we talked about this a little bit this morning, is, again, we have the veterinary food, the veterinary um, directive that basically says we can't have important antibiotics for production purposes. And so if I have an antibiotic now, I have to get a prescription from a veterinarian since January 2017 in order to administer that antibiotic. Um, 
And then there's various state laws. Again, California and Maryland have laws above and beyond the veterinary feed directive, okay? Um, again, California is a little bit more, more stringent, but again, the key difference is they outlaw some of the preventive use that the veterinary feed directive with the veterinarian prescription you can do. Um, and then we have things like the poultry industry where Purdue has kind of gone antibiotic free just on their own from consumer demand, right? And so that is not necessarily regulations, but in Maryland, we have a large poultry industry. Purdue is kind of um, the poultry, the big, the big um, person, um, the big company in our, in our neck of the woods. And again, their consumers are now, or their producers are all antibiotic free that feed to them. And that was a Purdue level. That was not based on regulations. That was a marketing decision that they made. Um, but again, having a sick chicken is very different than having a sick right? So if you have a sick cow, we're likely going to administer antibiotics, have that cow um, be healthy again, and then put it back into, um, into our milk supply. What's interesting, and this was brought up this morning, is again with, with, organic, um, with organics, in Europe, you can actually treat your cow, and then at or after a certain amount of time, it will go back into the organics production. In the U.S., if I'm an organic dairy farm, and my cow is sick, I actually have to treat that cow on farm, so my manure actually stays on that farm. It gets treated like it would, um, gets applied to the fields, but that cow and the milk associated with that cow can never be used in another organic um, um, farm. Okay, so they have to be sold to conventional. That's the rules. So, what we did was we looked again, we had 11 farms across New York, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. We sampled at all points over 18 months in the manure stream. Okay, we also actually got all of the antibiotic records from all of our farms. So we were trying to look at, this is the antibiotics that was administered on the farm, and here's where I can find it through the manure stream. Before and after solid liquid separation, in the lagoon during drawdowns, um, in you know, before and after digestion, we looked at everywhere as it goes through and compared it to the antibiotic usage on that farm. Um, we also are looking now at, in our phase two, we also are looking at um, composting. So we already did kind of normal composting as they do on farm. So it was just a pile, right? That's what the compost they did on farm, we looked at it there. What we're now doing is actually these high temperature ones, we're actually gonna look at a high throughput right away John composting. And then we're also, we again did mesophilic digesters on farm as, the, as they ran it. And we're now gonna be looking at thermophilic digestion and um, thermal hydrolysis treatment prior to digestion. Um, and then again, we did a lab, which I'll go over. We actually did lab digestions where we dosed it with um, antimicrobials, antibiotics, and to see what happens um, during the digestion process. Um, the other thing that we are doing is we're looking at stakeholder perceptions. Um, and so we're doing a lot of survey work and interview with farmers, understanding their perceptions of um, AMR. And which was really interesting is, um, so the researcher that was doing this, we were going through the survey questions, and one of their survey questions is, do you know um, what the veterinary feed directive is for dairy farmers? Do you know the veterinary feed directive? I said, don't you need to ask that. Like, that's a crazy question. Of course they know. He kept it in there, and 30% so far, we're still in the middle of the survey, don't know the veterinary feed directive of his dairy farmers. I was floored. I told him to take the question out. He didn't listen. Good, good idea. Also, my husband. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that complicates matters. But he didn't listen. It kept in there. And we now, you know, at least we're still doing the surveys, but as of now, about 30%, so they weren't aware of the veterinary feed directive. Okay. Um, okay, so specifically, this is just, I'm not going to do all of the data. I don't have time, but this is specifically looking at antibiotics coming in and out of digesters in the field. So these are digesters on dairy manure um, farms. And this is basically looking at tetracycline and the sulfamides coming in and out of um, the digesters. And what's interesting is normally we got nothing, right? We're below detection limit, we're right at detection limit. Nothing's coming in and out of these digesters. And then what happens is we get these spikes. So here we have this spike. And again, but this is in the, um, the influent right here. And our effluent, it's up here. This is our effluent. This is our influent. This is our effluent, okay? So we're making antibiotics in our digester, right? No, <laughs> we're not making antibiotics in our digester. Again, anything, and we went around the manure trail, everything has a different resonance time. 
it sits in the holding pit for so long. It goes into the digester for so long. So when we take an influent and effluent sample, those mean nothing in terms of what diseases have happened on the farms and the number of cows treated, right? Because everything has a different residence time. So again, we see these spikes, but without really knowing the resonance time and how that matches up, it doesn't really tell us much. The other thing that's really interesting when we look at antimicrobials is when you go into the digestion process, it's like a big, like it's kind of chunky, right? It's manure, <laughs> right? It's, it's chunky. It goes into the digester. During digestion, it comes out as a nice tea, right? So when you do extraction efficiencies, and, and I don't want to steal thunder, of Dr. Yarbrough, I'll talk about this. Um, when you do extraction efficiency of that, that bulk, and then you do it on your tea, it makes a big difference. Even when you, when you, um, you know, you do something to, you do an uh, efficiency, and she'll talk more about this to, to look at your efficiency of your extractions. But again, this is what we're finding. And, and we've looked back, so we have students that are doing this also in the wastewater industry, and one of the things they're finding kind of the same type of thing where they're looking at metals, or they're looking at everything during digestion, and they're increasing during digestion. It's not increasing, but when you look at your nanograms per gram dry weight, what happened? You reduced your solids. So when you reduced everything else that was in there, right, your concentrations didn't go up, everything else went down. So your relative concentration went up. It's the same thing when you look at metals and digestion, right? In the biosolids, you have higher concentrations of metals because, again, everything else went away. <laughs> and so those metals didn't, weren't affected by digestion, and so it looks like they go up. We're seeing basically the same thing in our digestion process. Um, again, so we also looked at um, antibiotics. So this is where we actually spiked in a bottle in our lab. We're like, all right, we're going to forget about this hydraulic retention times. We're going to spike it in our, in our bottles, in our lab. We're going to do digestion in the lab. And then we can tell actual reductions. And again, when we did that way, again, the sulfates, we got 99% reduction. We got those down. We were like, great. This is working great. So then we went on and did our tetracyclings. Our tetracyclings, negative 8% to 95%. I mean, come on. What do you do with that data? Right? <laughs> and so what we're finding, so just, just so you're clear on this, we did spikes at 1 milligram and 10 milligrams. And again, one milligram and 10 milligrams, and then a mixture of the two antibiotics at one milligram. And the reason why we chose these concentrations was we never found um, any antibiotics in the field anywhere above one milligram per liter. Okay? Because again, you think about the number of cows that are being treated and the amount of manure on these farms. We never found it above that. And if you go back in the literature for anaero anaerobic digestion literature and you look at the effects of biogas production, again, here's without, here's just the manure. Again, at one, we see like 10% reduction with 10 milligrams per liter. But again, we didn't find anything above one, to be clear. We just, you know, times it by a factor to 10 for fun. Um, but again, you don't see any decrease in anaerobic digestion. So when you look at these antibiotic digestion studies and look at the effects of adding an um, antibiotics to the digester, there are these really high concentrations, 50 milligrams per liter, 40 milligrams per liter. We never found that in the farm. We never found, we were usually zero. And if we were, it was never even above one, never. And so again, we tried to do it at the, at, the, at the levels you would actually see on the farm. Again, with the tetracyclines, the tetracyclines love to zorb onto the solids. And so some of ours, they zorbed and didn't really digest. We, can, we had triplicates of all of these things. And these were just all over the place. Okay. So then we looked at gene copies. So we looked at our, um, our antibiotic resistant genes. And again, just to orient you, this is the before digestion, and these are after digestion, again, with the one milligram, the 10 milligram, with the tetracycline and the sulfas. And again, you can see <laughs> our error bars are kind of all over the place, but welcome to metagenomics and welcome to digestion research and manure research. Um, but again, we did see in general that the tetracycline genes decreased during digestion. Um, and, but we saw the sulfas, again, they decreased, but less. And it wasn't even near the antibiotics were decreasing a lot, but the sulfa genes didn't really decrease that much. So, I mean, it's all right. But what we found is that basically it followed these um, 16 sRNA. So during digestion, <laughs> you're decreasing kind of everything, <laughs> including the, 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 the resistant genes, right? Not, not, you know, anything too exciting. We also looked at anaerobic, I'm um, sorry, we also looked at composting. And again, this was just the pile of compost that the farmer did. And he took a sick packed, the sick cow packed bedding, okay? So his cows all, that are sick all go on packed bedding. And what he does is every month he clears.
figures out that packed bedding and he composts it. He says he composts it. He puts it in a pile and lets it sit for 35 days and then he puts it on the field. Okay, so that's what he does. So we monitored what was happening in his um, compost pile. And so again, we were looking at these concentrations and what we actually found is just when he takes that sick pile bedding, you go down like a foot or two and that's sick, the sick pile bedding, it's hot under there, right? So it's already composting in there. But again, he takes it to the field. So again, this is our concentration of antibiotics. Um, these are, our, this is again, TC and ETC, and this is at other daughter compounds, OTC, ATC, and ECTC. Again, look at the, the concentrations here. This is quite high for the TCs and the ETCs. So our tetracycline, again, it's kind of all over the place. And then we see, again, these OTC, OTCs go up. But again, these are daughter compounds from the TC degradation. Um, and so, but again, we weren't really seeing, if you look in the literature, they see these composting and these great reductions during composting. And at least when we were just doing it as the farmer was doing it, we didn't see that. We just It just wasn't there. Um, so again, if we look at our days of, um, after our, um, oops, after our different different days, again, we're still, we started in the 400, 500, went down to 300, went back up to 600. I mean, we're just still seeing this stuff. So if we look at kind of our compost pile, again, these are our general microbial dynamics during composting. We have our bacteria numbers, we have our temperature, um, and here's where we are with the fungi, and here's where our digestion. Again, this is the temperature during our 40 days that he just left it there in the pile. We didn't really get this big spike that we expected, but we were still in the temperature range. I mean, we were around 50, 60, and again, 50, 60, we were still in the temperature range, but we didn't get that big spike of temperature. And so it may be, again, part of the pile management. But again, if we're talking about the effects of composting on antimicrobial, we should look at how they're actually composting it in the field, which is this, right? Um, versus, you know, a very lab base where we're really, you know, looking at the temperature and doing it. But this is how the farmer did it. Um, so what we're doing now is we're actually looking at, um, again, rotary drum composting. Um, so this is actually DC wastewater treatment plant. Prior to anaerobic digestion, they have a thermal hydrolysis unit, which is basically like, um, what's the thing I got it for Christmas? The Instapod or what's it? Is that it? Instapod. Instapod. Yeah. It's that. Okay, so it's high pressure. <laughs> They're instapotting the waste. Um, so these are the instapods. And then it goes into the digester, okay? And so that's what they do to lyse the cells, and then it goes into um, um, mesophilic um, digestion, okay? So we're actually looking at the effects of that. So they have a little pilot unit. You know, it's yay big. And we're actually going to put manure into their pilot unit and do that same thermal hydrolysis, play with the parameters, and see kind of if we can say, okay, now we know we got rid of it. Now let's dial it back to like mesophilic and try to figure out at what point are we no longer seeing the reductions that we expect to see. So we'll be doing that this summer. Um, again, a, a part of this again has to do, we're doing also thermophilic versus mesophilic digestion trials to try to see, can we really get rid of this? Um, so again, we talked about, we're doing the interviews with farmers, semi-structured interviews and surveys. Um, so that's currently ongoing. Um, we're also doing kind of a communication strategy. So one thing that we are doing is we're having a conference in May where we're specifically, it's like a workshop, just like 30, 35 people. We're specifically looking at the human dimension side of AMR and agriculture. So not, you know, the analytical techniques. It's, it's the, the economics person who's doing it from this point of view. It's the communication person. So we're looking at kind of the input, so the surveys, um, the economic analysis, the policy analysis, kind of the inputs. And then we're also looking at the communication part, the outputs. So we have extension people as well as people that are kind of scattered across different colleges, aren't necessarily in our, you know, ag engineering college or whatever it might be doing this work. Um, so we have people coming together to try to really understand the human dimensions in terms of the human dimension inputs and then the communication outputs. Um, we're working with Ithaca College to, again, do these kind of outreach videos. And we're, we haven't started, luckily, because we're still getting the information. But it's one of those things where it's like, how do you put out information about something that it's complicated, right? We haven't really shown clear effects of antibiotic usage and resistance. We haven't even shown clear effects of antibiotic usage and it going through the manure. We actually had one of our farms was an organic farm, and we still found um, antibiotic resistant genes throughout that farm, right? But it's organic. And so how do you, again, if something's really complicated, 
and there really isn't a clear answer. How do you message something? And again, I think part of it, we talked about a lot of this this morning, is, is just really trying to message it about what is what we know and all the things that we don't really know. And so we're working on that. Um, and I think I'm running out of time, but I think I'm done. Um, yeah, and that's it. <laughs> Perfect timing. You can go ahead and um, we have some questions for our speaker while I get the slides changed over. Go ahead. Yeah, I was yeah. here for your presentation. Yeah. I was wondering, um, in your um, persistent memes, do you use uh, other data sites in persistent memes or only tech and constellation? We did, um, there was tech, yeah, just tech and again, we didn't, for this work, that, that work, <coughs> The ones who did our tetracycline gene analysis is actually Krista Wellington and um, Lutgoy Raskin at University of Michigan. Mm -hmm. So they're the ones that did it and they just did TED. Yeah. So when you were saying that compost was out of maybe more club storage, <laughs> right. they like, weren't aerating or doing, turning it or doing anything. Okay. Yeah, they, they, it's, like it's, it's storage, but they called it compost. And um, they would take their sick bath bedding, they would store it. They did turn it twice. They did turn it. So they did turn it twice. Um, and But again, we didn't see, we were expecting with the turns, we'd see that temperature go down. and It just kind of stayed the same. And it was their packed cow bedding. And um, yeah, we didn't really see what we expected to see for compost. And again, the antibiotics, they just kind of stayed there. But so in, it, in the barn, it was getting warm. Do we know the temperature in the barn? So no, because we started temperature when we were when they set up the piles. Yeah, yeah. But again, just going into that sick pile bedding and putting your hands underneath at the you know going down in the pile, it was warm. Like it's definitely already composting inside of that barn um, because it's warm when you put your hand down there. Um, but I don't know the temperature, but that would be a good no, no, I question. No, 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 that's good. I would still call it composting. I'm with you. It's yeah. It's, I, mean, I don't know. It's just not perfect. Comedy. No, exactly. They I was called, just curious if they were just like, finally. No, they turned it twice in 35 days. Okay. 